Hello friends, you are listening to It Ends With Us, authored by Colleen Hoover and narrated to you by audiobooks with Keeper of Lost Stories. Please subscribe to this channel as it will mean a lot to me and encourage me to create more such videos. Thank you. Chapter 16 I mean... I'm not trying to be selfish, but you did not taste the desert lily, Elisa groans. Oh, it was so good. We are never going back there, I say to her. She stomps her foot like a little kid, but... Nope, we have to respect your brother's feelings. She folds her arms over her chest. I know, I know. Why did you have to be a hormonal teenager and fall in love with the best chef in Boston. He wasn't a chef when I knew him. Whatever, she says. She walks out of my office and closes the door. My phone buzzes with an incoming text. Ryle, five hours down, about five more to go. So far, so good. Hand is great. I sigh, relieved. I wasn't sure if he would be able to do the surgery today, but knowing how much he was looking forward to it makes me happy for him. Me, steadiest hand in all of Boston. I open my laptop and check my email. The first thing I see is an inquiry from the Boston Globe. I open it and it's from a journalist interested in running an article about the store. I grin like an idiot and start emailing her back when Elisa knocks on the door. She opens it and sticks her head in. Hey, she says. Hey, I say back. She taps her fingers on the door frame. Remember a few minutes ago when you told me I could never go back to Bibbs because it's unfair to Ryle? That the boy you loved when you were a teenager is the owner? I fall back against my chair. What do you want, Elisa? She scrunches up her nose and says, If it isn't fair that we can't go back there because of the owner, how is it fair that the owner gets to come here? What? I close my laptop and stand up. Why would you say that? Is he here? She nods and slips inside my office, closing the door behind her. He is. He asked for you, and I know... You are with my brother and I am with child, but can we please just take a moment to silently admire the perfection that is that man? She smiles dreamily and I roll my eyes. Elisa, those eyes though. She opens the door and walks out. I follow behind her and catch sight of Atlas. She is right here, Elisa says. Would you like me to take your coat? We don't take coats. Atlas glances up when I walk out of my office. His eyes cut to Elisa and he shakes his head. No, thank you. I won't go long enough. Elisa leans forward over the counter, dropping her chin on her hands. Stay as long as you like. In fact, are you looking for an extra job? Lily needs to hire more people and we are looking for someone who can lift really heavy things. Requires a lot of flexibility, bending over. I narrow my eyes at Alisa and mouth, enough. She shrugs innocently. I hold my door open for Atlas but avoid looking directly at him as he passes me. I feel a world of guilt for what happened last night, but also a world of anger for what happened last night. I walk around my desk and drop into my seat prepared for an argument, but when I look up at him, I clamp my mouth shut. He's smiling. He waves his hand around in a circle as he takes a seat across from me. This is incredible, Lily. I pause. Thank you. He continues, smiling at me like he's proud of me. Then he places a bag between us on the desk and pushes it toward me. A gift, he says. You can open it later. 
Why is he buying me gifts? He has a girlfriend. I have a boyfriend. Our past has already caused enough problems in my present. I certainly don't need gifts to exasperate that. Why are you buying me gifts, Atlas? He leans back in his seat and crosses his arms over his chest. I bought it three years ago. I've been holding on to it in case I ever ran into you. Consider it, Atlas. He hasn't changed, damn it. I pick up the gift and set it on the floor behind my desk. I try to release some of the tension. I am feeling that it's really hard when everything about him makes me so tense. I came here to apologize to you, he says. I wave off his apology, letting him know it is unnecessary. It's fine. It was a misunderstanding. Ryle is fine. He laughs under his breath. That's not what I'm apologizing for, he says. I would never apologize for defending you. You were not defending me, I say. There was nothing to defend. He tilts his head, giving me the same look that he gave me last night. The one that lets me know how disappointed in me he is. It stings deep in my gut. I clear my throat. Why are you apologizing, then? He's quiet for a moment, contemplative. I wanted to apologize for saying that you sounded like your mother, and that was hurtful, and I'm sorry. I don't know why I always feel like crying when I'm around him. When I think about him, when I read about him, it's like my emotions are still tethered to him somehow, and I can't figure out how to cut the strings. His eyes drop to my desk. He reaches forward and grabs three things. A pen, a sticky note, my phone. He writes something down on the sticky note and then proceeds to pull my phone apart. He slips the case off and puts the sticky note between the case and the phone, then slides the cover back over it. He pushes my phone back across the desk. I look down at it and then up at him. He stands up and tosses the pen on my desk. It's my cell phone number. Keep it hidden there, in case you ever need it. I wince at the gesture, the unnecessary gesture. I won't need it. I hope not. He walks to the door and reaches for the doorknob, and I know this is my only chance to get out what I have to say before he's out of my life forever. Atlas, wait. I stand up so fast my chair scoots across the room and bumps against the wall. He half turns and faces me. What Ryle said to you last night? I never. I bring a nervous hand up to my neck. I can feel my heart beating in my throat. I never said that to him. He was hurt and upset, and he misconstrued my words from a long time ago. The corner of Atlas's mouth twitches, and I'm not sure if he's trying not to smile or trying not to frown. He faces me straight on. Believe me, Lily, I know that wasn't a pity F. I was there. He walks out the door, and his words knock me straight back into my seat. Only, my seat is no longer there. It's there on the other side of my office, and I'm now on the floor. Alisa rushes in, and I'm lying on my back behind my desk. Lily! She runs around the desk and stands over me. Are you okay? I hold up a thumb. Fine, just missed my chair. She reaches out her hand and helps me to my feet. What was that all about? I glance at the door as I retrieve my chair. I take a seat and look down at my phone. Nothing. He was just apologizing. Elisa sighs longingly and looks back at the door. So does that mean he doesn't want the job? I have got to hand it to her. Even in the midst of emotional turmoil, she can make me laugh. Get back to work before I dock your pay. She laughs and makes to leave. I tap my pen against my desk and then say, Alisa, wait. I know, she says. 
cutting me off. Ral doesn't need to know about this visit. You don't have to tell me. I smile. Thank you. She closes the door. I reach down and pick up the bag with my three-year-old gift inside of it. I pull it out and can easily tell it's a book wrapped in tissue paper. I tear the tissue paper away and fall against the back of my chair. There is a picture of Ellen the genres on the front. The title is Seriously, I'm Kidding. I laugh and then open the book gasping quietly when I see it's autographed. I run my fingers over the words of the inscription. Lily, Atlas says, just keep swimming. Ellen, the genres. I run my finger over her signature. Then I drop the book on my desk, press my forehead against it, and fake cry against the cover. Chapter 17 It's after 7 before I get home. Ryle called an hour ago and said he wouldn't be coming over tonight. The Confucian cackle separation was a success. But he's staying at the hospital overnight to make sure there aren't complications. I walk in the door to my quiet apartment. I change into my quiet pajamas. I eat a quiet sandwich and then I lie down in my quiet bedroom and open my quiet new book, hoping it can quiet my emotions. Sure enough, three hours and the majority of a book later, all the emotions from the last several days began to seep out of me. I place a bookmark on the page where I stop reading and close it. I stare at the book for a long time. I think about Ryle. I think about Atlas. I think about how sometimes, no matter how convinced you are that your life will turn out a certain way, all that certainty can be washed away with a simple change in tide. I take the book Atlas bought me and put it in the closet with all my journals. Then I pick up the one that's filled with memories of him, and I know it's finally time to read the last entry I wrote. Then I can close the book for good. Dear Ellen, Most of the time I'm thankful you don't know I exist, and that I've never really mailed you any of these things I write to you. But sometimes, especially tonight, I wish you did. I just need someone to talk to about everything I'm feeling. It's been six months since I have seen Atlas, and I honestly don't know where he is or how he's doing. So much has happened since the last letter I wrote to you. When Atlas moved to Boston, I thought it was the last time I would see him for a while, but it wasn't. I saw him again after he left. Several weeks later, it was my 16th birthday and when he showed up, it became the absolute best day of my life. And then the absolute worst. It had been exactly 42 days since Atlas left for Boston. I just need someone to talk to about everything I'm feeling. It's been six months since I've seen Atlas. And I honestly don't know where he is or how he's doing. So much has happened since the last letter I wrote to you when Atlas moved to Boston. I thought it was the last time I would see him for a while, but it wasn't. I saw him again after he left. Several weeks later, it was my 16th birthday, and when he showed up, it became the absolute best day of my life, and then the absolute worst. It had been exactly 42 days since Atlas left for Boston. I counted every day like it would help somehow. I was so depressed, Ellen. I still am. People say that teenagers don't know how to love like an adult. Part of me believes that. But I'm not an adult and so I have nothing to compare it to. But I do believe it's probably different. There's probably more maturity, more respect more responsibility, but no matter how different the substance of a love might be at different ages in a person's life, I know that love still has to weigh the same. You feel that weight on your shoulders and in your stomach, 
and on your heart no matter how old are you. And my feelings for Atlas are very heavy. Every night I cry myself to sleep and I whisper, just keep swimming. But it gets really hard to swim when you feel like you're anchored in the water. Now that I think about it, I've probably been experiencing the stages of grief in a sense. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance. I was deep in the depression stage that night of my 16th birthday. My mother had tried to make the day a good one. She bought me gardening supplies, made my favorite cake and the two of us went to dinner tonight together. But by the time I'd crawled into bed that night, I could not shake the sadness. I was crying when I heard the tap on my shoulder of the window. At first, I thought it had started raining, but then I heard his voice. I jumped up and ran to the window, my heart in hysterics. He was standing there in the dark, smiling at me. I raised the window and helped him inside and he took me in his arms and held me there for so long while I cried. He smelled so good. I could tell when I hugged him that he had put on some much needed weight in just the six weeks since I'd last seen him. He pulled back and wiped the tears off my cheeks. Why are you crying, Lily? I was embarrassed that I was crying. I cried a lot that month, probably more than any other month of my life. It was probably just the hormones of being a teenage girl mixed with stress of how my father treated my mother and then having to say goodbye to Atlas. I grabbed a shirt from the floor and dried my eyes. Then we sat down on the bed. He pulled me against his chest and leaned against my headboard. What are you doing here? I asked him. It's your birthday, he said, and you're still my favorite person and I've missed you. It was probably no later than 10 o'clock when he got there, but we talked so much. I remember it was after midnight the next time I looked at the clock. I can't even remember what all we talked about, but I do remember how it felt. He seemed so happy and there was a light in his eyes that I had never seen there before, like he had finally found his home. He said he wanted to tell me something and his voice grew serious. He readjusted me so that I was straddling his lap because he wanted me to look at him in the eyes when he told me. I was thinking maybe he was about to tell me he had a girlfriend or that he was leaving even sooner for the military. But what he said next shocked me. He said the first night he went to that old house, he wasn't there because he needed a place to stay. He went there to kill himself. My hands went up to my mouth because I had no idea things had gotten that bad for him. So bad that he did not even want to live anymore. I hope you never know what it's like to feel that lonely, Lily, he said. He went on to tell me that the first night he was at the house, he was sitting in living room floor with the razor blade to his wrist. Right when he was about to use it, my bedroom light went on. You were standing there like an angel, backlit by the light of heaven, he said. I could not take my eyes off you. He watched me walk around my bedroom for a while, watched me lie on the bed and write in my journal, and he put down the razor blade because he said it would be a month since life had been and given him an, any sort of feeling at all, and looking at me gave him a little bit of feeling, and after not be numb enough to end things that night. Then a day or two later is when I took him the food and set it on his back porch. I guess you already knew the rest of the story. You saved my life, Lily, he said to me, and you weren't even trying. He leaned forward and kissed that spot between my shoulder and my neck that he always kisses. I like that he did it again. I don't like much about my body, but that spot on my collarbone has become my favorite part of me. He took my hands in his and told me he was leaving sooner than he planned for the military. 
but that he could not leave without telling me thank you. He told me he had been gone for four years and that the last thing he wanted for me was to be a 16-year-old girl, not living my life because of a boyfriend I never got to see or hear from. The next thing he said made his blue eyes tear up until they looked clear. He said, Lily, life is a funny thing. We only get so many years to live it. So we have to do everything we can to make sure those years are as good as they can be. We should not waste time on things that might happen someday or maybe even never. I knew what he was saying, that he was leaving for the military and he did not want me to hold on to him while he was gone. He wasn't really breaking up with me because we weren't even really together. We had just been the two people who helped each other when we needed it and got our hearts fused together along the way. It was hard being let go by someone who had never really grabbed hold of me completely in the first place. In all the time we have spent together, I think we both sort of knew this wasn't a forever thing. I'm not sure why, because I could easily love him that way. I think maybe under normal circumstances, if we were together like typical teenagers and he had an average life with a home, we could be that kind of couple. The kind who comes together so easily and never experiences a life where cruelty sometimes intercepts. I did not even try to get him to change his mind that night. I feel like we have the kind of connection that even the fires of hell could not severe. I feel like he could go spend his time in the military and I will spend my years being a teenager and then it will all fall back into place when the timing is right. I'm going to make a promise to you, he said. When my life is good enough for you to be a part of it, I will come find you but I don't want you to wait around for me because that might never happen. I did not like that promise because it meant one of two things. Either he thought he might never make it out of the military alive or he did not think his life would ever be good enough for me. His life was already good enough for me, but I nodded my head and forced a smile. If you don't come back for me, I will come for you, and it won't be pretty, Atlas Corrigan. He laughed and my, at my threat. Well, it won't be too hard to find me. You know exactly where I will be. I smiled. Where everything is better. He smiled back. In Boston. And then he kissed me. Helen, I know you are an adult and know all about what comes next. But I still don't feel comfortable telling you what happened over those couple of hours. Let's just say we both kissed a lot, we both laughed a lot, we both loved a lot, we both breathed a lot, a lot. And we both had to cover our mouths and be as quiet and still as we could so we would not get caught. When we were finished, he held me against him, skin to skin, hand to heart, he kissed me and looked straight in my eyes. I love you, Lily. Everything you are, I love you. I know those words get thrown around a lot, especially by teenagers, a lot of times prematurely and without much merit. But when he said them to me, I knew he wasn't saying it like he was in love with me. It wasn't that kind of I love you. Imagine all the people you meet in your life. There are so many. They come in like waves, trickling in and out with the tide. Some waves are much bigger and make more of an impact than others. Sometimes the waves bring with them things from deep in bottom of the sea, and they leave those things tossed into the shore, imprints against the grains of sand that prove the waves had once been there long after the tide recedes. That was what Atlas was telling me when he said I love you. He was letting me know that I was the biggest wave he would ever come across and I brought so much with me with that my impressions would always be there even when the tide rolled out. 
After he said he loved me, he told me he had a birthday present for me. He pulled out a small brown bag. It isn't much, but it's all I could afford. I opened the bag and pulled out the best present I'd ever received. It was a magnet that said Boston on the top. At the bottom in tiny letters it said, Where everything is better. I told him I would keep it forever and every time I look at it, I will think of him. When I started out this letter, I said my 16th birthday was one of the best days of my life because up until that second it was. It was the next few minutes that weren't. Before Atlas had shown up that night, I was not expecting him, so I did not think to lock my bedroom door. My father heard me in there, talking to someone, and when he threw open my door and saw Atlas in bed with me, he was angrier than I'd ever seen him. And Atlas was at a disadvantage by not being prepared for what came next. I will never forget that moment for as long as I live, being completely helpless as my father came down on him with a baseball bat. The sound of bones snapping was the only thing piercing through my screams. I still don't know who called the police. I'm sure it was my mother, but it's been six months, and we still haven't talked about that night. By the time the police got to my bedroom and pulled my father off of him, I did not even recognize Atlas. He was covered in so much blood. I was hysterical. Hysterical. Not only did they have to take Atlas away in an ambulance, they also had to call an ambulance for me because I could not breathe. It was the first and only panic attack I have ever had. No one would tell me where he was or if he was even okay. My father wasn't even arrested for what he had done. Word got out that Atlas had been staying in that old house and that he had been homeless. My father became revered for his heroic act saving his little girl from the homeless boy who manipulated her into having sex with him. My father said I had shamed their whole family by giving the town something to gossip about. And let me tell you, they still gossip about it. I heard Katie on the bus today telling someone she tried to warn me about Atlas. She said she knew he was bad news from the moment she laid eyes on him, which is crap. If Atlas had been on the bus with me, I probably would have kept my mouth shut and been mature about it, like he tried to teach me to be. Instead, I was so angry, I turned around and told Katie she could go to hell. I told her Atlas was a better human than she would ever be, and if I ever heard her say one more bad thing about him, she would regret it. She just rolled her eyes and said, Jesus, Lily, did he brainwash you? He was a dirty, thieving, homeless kid who was probably on drugs. He used you for food and sex, and now you are defending him? She's lucky the bus stopped at my house right then. I grabbed my backpack and walked off the bus, then went inside and cried in my room for three hours straight. Now my head hurts, but I knew the only thing that would make me feel better is if I finally got it all out on paper. I have been avoiding writing this letter for six months now. No offense, Ellen, but my head still hurts. So does my heart. Maybe even more right now than it did yesterday. This letter did not help one damn bit. I think I'm going to take a break from writing to you for a while. Writing to you reminds me of him, and it all hurts too much. Until he comes back to me, I'm just going to keep pretending to be okay. I will keep pretending to swim, when really all I am doing is floating, barely keeping my head above water. Lily. I flip to the next page, but it's blank. That was the last time I ever wrote to Ellen. I also never heard from Atlas again, and a huge part of me never blamed him. He almost died at the hands of my father. There is not much room for forgiveness there. I knew he survived and that he was okay because my curiosity has sometimes gotten the best of me over the years and I would find what I could about him online. There wasn't much though, enough to let me know he had survived and that he was in the military. I still never got to him out of my head though. Time made things better but sometimes I would see something that would remind me of him and it would put me in a funk. 
it wasn't until I was in college for a couple of years and dating someone else that I realized maybe Atlas wasn't supposed to be my whole life. Maybe he was only supposed to be a part of it. Maybe love isn't something that comes full circle. It just ebbs and flows in and out, just like the people in our lives. On a particularly lonely night in college, I went alone to a tattoo studio and had a heart put in the spot where he used to kiss me. It's a tiny heart about the size of a thumbprint and it looks just like the heart he carved for me out of the oak tree. It's not fully closed at the top and I wonder if Atlas carved the heart like that on purpose because that's how my heart feels every time I think about him. It just feels like there is a little hole in it letting out all the air. After college, I ended up moving to Boston, not necessarily because I was hoping to find him, but because I had to see for myself if Boston really was better. Plethora held nothing for me anyway, and I wanted to get as far away from my father as I could. Even though he was sick and could no longer hurt my mother, he still somehow made me want to escape the entire state of Maine. So that's exactly what I did. Seeing Atlas in his restaurant for the first time filled me with so many emotions. I did not know how to process them. I was glad to see that he was okay. I was happy that he looked healthy. But I would be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit heartbroken. That he never tried to find me like he promised. I love him. I still do and I always will. He was a huge wave that left a lot of imprints on my life and I will feel the weight of that love until I die. I have accepted that. But things are different now. After today when he walked out of my office, I thought long and hard about us. I think our lives are where they are supposed to be. I have Ryle, Atlas has his girlfriend. We both have the careers we had always hoped for. Just because we did not end up on the same wave doesn't mean we aren't still a part of the same ocean. Things with Ryle are still fairly new, but I feel that same depth with him that I used to feel with Atlas. He loves me just like Atlas did, and I know if Atlas had a chance to get to know him, he would be able to see that, and he would be happy for me. Sometimes, an unexpected wave comes along, sucks you up, and refuses to spit you back out. Ryle is my unexpected tidal wave, and right now, I'm skimming the beautiful surface. Part 2 Chapter 18 Oh God, I think I might throw up. Ryle puts his thumb under my chin and tilts my face up to his. He grins at me. You'll be fine. Stop freaking out. I shake my hands out and bounce up and down inside the elevator. I can't help it, I say. Everything you and Elisa have told me about your mother makes me so nervous. My eyes widen and I bring my hands up to my mouth. Oh God, Ryle, what if she asks me questions about Jesus? I don't go to church. I mean, I read the Bible when I was younger, but I don't know answers to any Bible trivia questions. He's really laughing now. He pulls me to him and kisses the side of my head. She won't talk about Jesus. She already loves you, based on what I've told her. All you have to do is be you, Lily. I start nodding. Be me. Okay, I think I can pretend to be me for one evening, right? The doors open and he walks me out of the elevator toward Elisa's apartment. It's funny watching him knock, but I guess he technically doesn't live here anymore. Over the last few months... He just sort of slowly began staying with me. All of his clothes are at my apartment. His toiletries. Last week he even hung that ridiculous blurry photograph of me up in our bedroom and it really felt official after that. Does she know we live together? I ask him. Is she okay with that? I mean, we aren't married. She goes to church every Sunday. Oh no, Ryle. What if your mother thinks I'm a blasphemous whore? Ryle nudges his head toward the apartment door, and I spin around to see his mother standing in the doorway, a layer of shock on her face. Mother, Ryle says, meet Lily, my blasphemous whore. Oh dear God, 
His mother reaches for me and pulls me in for a hug. And her laughter is everything I need to get me through this moment. Lily, she says, pushing me out to arm's length. So she can get a look at me, good look at me. Sweetie, I don't think you're a blasphemous whore. You're the angel I've been praying with land and Ryle's lap for the last ten years. She ushers us into the apartment. Ryle's father is the next to greet me with a hug. No, definitely not a blasphemous whore, he says. Not like Marshall here, who sank his teeth into my little girl when she was only seventeen. He glares back at Marshall. Who is sitting on the couch? Marshall laughs. That's where you're wrong, Dr. Kincaid. Because Elisa was the one who sank her teeth into me first. My teeth were in another girl who tasted like Cheetos and... Marshall doubles over when Elisa elbows him in the side. And just like that, every single fear I had has vanished. They are perfect. They are normal. They say whore and laugh at Marshall's jokes. I could not ask for anything better. Three hours later, I'm lying on Elisa's bed with her. Their parents went to bed early, claiming jet lag. Ryle and Marshall are living in the, are in the living room, watching sports. I have my hand on Elisa's stomach, waiting to feel the baby kick. Her feet are right here, she says, moving my hand over a few inches. Give it a few seconds. She's really active tonight. We remain quiet while we both wait for her to kick. When it happens, I squeal with laughter. Oh my god, it's like an alien. Elisa holds her hands on her stomach, smiling. These last two and a half months are going to be hell, she says. I'm so ready to meet her. Me too. I can't wait to be an aunt. I can't wait for you and Ral to have a baby, she says. I fall onto my back and put my hands behind my bed. I don't know if he wants any. We have never really talked about it. It doesn't matter if he doesn't want any, she says. He will. He didn't want a relationship before you. He didn't want to get married before you. And I feel a proposal coming on any month now. I prop my head up on my hand and face her. We have barely been together six months. Pretty sure he wants to wait a lot longer than that. I don't push things with Ryle when it comes to speeding things up in our relationship. Our lives are perfect how they are. We are too busy for a wedding anyway, so I don't mind if he wants to wait a lot longer. What about you? Elisa processes. Would you say yes if he proposed? I laugh. Are you kidding me? Of course I would marry him tonight. Elisa looks over my shoulder at her bedroom door. She purses her lips together and tries to hide her smile. He's standing in the doorway, isn't she? Isn't he? She nods. He heard me say that, didn't he? She nods again. I roll onto my back and look at Ryle, propped up against the doorframe with his arms folded over his chest. I can't tell what he's thinking after hearing that. His expression is tight. His jaw is tight. His eyes are narrowed in my direction. Lily, he says with a stoic composure, I would marry the hell out of you. His words make me smile the most embarrassing, wildest smile, so I put a pillow over my face. Why, thank you, Ryle, I say, my words muffled by the pillow. That's really sweet, I hear Elisa say. My brother is actually sweet. The pillow is pulled away from me and Ryle is standing over me, holding it at his hand. Let's go. My heart begins to beat faster. Right now? He nods. I took the weekend off because my parents are in town. You have people who can run your store for you. Let's go to Vegas and get married. Elisa sits up on the bed. You can't do that, she says. Lily is a girl. She wants a real wedding with flowers and bridesmaids and shit. Ryle looks back at me. Do you want a real wedding with flowers and bridesmaids and shit? I think about it for a second. No. The three of us are quiet for a moment and then Elisa starts kicking her legs up and down on the bed, giddy with excitement. They are getting married, she yells. She rolls off the bed and rushes toward the living room. Marshall, pack our bags. We are going to Vegas.
Ryle reaches down and grabs my hand, pulling me to a stand. He's smiling, but there is no way I'm doing this unless I know for sure he wants it. Are you sure about this, Ryle? He runs his hands through my hair and pulls my face to his, brushing his lips against mine. Naked truth, he whispers. I'm so excited to be your husband. I could piss my damn pants. Chapter 19 It's been six weeks, Mom. You gotta get over it. My mother sighs into the phone. You are my only daughter. I can't help it if I've been dreaming about your wedding your whole life. Still, she hasn't forgiven me, even though she was there. We called her right before Alisa booked our flights. We forced her out of bed. We forced Ryle's parents out of bed. And then we forced them all on a midnight flight to Vegas. I did not. She did not try to talk to me out of it because I'm sure she could tell that Ryle and I had made up our minds by the time she made it to the airport. But she hasn't let me forget it. She's been dreaming of a huge wedding and dress shopping and cake tasting since the day I was born. I kick my feet up on the couch. How about I make it up to you? I say to her. What if, whenever we decide to have a baby, I promise to do it the natural way and not buy one in Vegas? My mom laughs. Then she sighs. As long as you give me grandchildren someday, I guess I can get over it. Ryle and I talked about kids on the flight to Vegas. I wanted to make sure that possibility was open for discussion in our future before I made a commitment to spend the rest of my life with him. He said it was definitely open for discussion. Then we cleared the air about a lot of other things that might cause problems down the road. I told him I wanted separate checking accounts, but since he makes more money than me, he has to buy me a lot of presents all the time to keep me happy. He agreed. He made me promise him I would never become vegan. That was a simple promise. I love cheese too much. I told him we had to start some kind of charity or at least donate to the ones Marshall and Elisa like. He said he already does and that made me want to marry him even sooner. He said he already does and that made me want to marry him even sooner. He made me promise to vote. He said I was allowed to vote Democratic, Republican or Independent as long as I made sure to vote. We shook on it. By the time we landed in Vegas, we were completely on the same page. I hear the front door unlocking, so I flip onto my back. Gotta go, I say to my mother. Ryle just got home. He closes the door behind him, and then I grin and say, Wait, let me rephrase that, Mom. My husband just got home. My mother laughs and tells me goodbye. I hang up with her and toss my phone aside. I bring my arm up above my head and rest it lazily against the arm of the couch. Then I prop my leg over the back of it, letting my skirt slide down, my thighs, and pull at my waist. Ryle drags his eyes up my body, grinning, as he makes his way over to me. He drops to his knees on the couch and slowly crawls up my body. How's my wife? he whispers. <clears throat> Planting kisses all around my mouth. I let my head fall back as he kisses down my neck. This is the life. We both work almost every day. He works twice as many hours as I do, and he only gets home before I'm in bed two or three nights a week. But the nights we actually do get to spend together, I tend to want him to spend those nights buried deep inside me. He doesn't complain. He lowers himself on top of me and mutters into my neck. I'm giving you a hickey. Don't move. I laugh, but I let him. My hair is long enough that I can cover it, and I've never had a hickey before. His lips remain in the same spot, sucking and kissing, until I can no longer feel the sting. He's pressed against me, bulging against his scrubs. I move my hands and shove his scrubs down far enough so that he can slide. He continues to kiss me. He took a shower first, and as soon as he got out, I jumped in. I told him we needed to wash the smell of sex off of us before we had dinner with Elisa and Marshall. Elisa is due in a few weeks. 
So she's forcing as much couple time on us as she can. She's worried we will stop coming to visit after the baby is born, which I know is ridiculous. The visits will just grow more frequent. I already love my niece more than any of them anyway. Okay, maybe not, but it's close. I try to avoid getting my hair wet as I rinse off. Because we are already running late, I grab my raisin and press it under my arm when I hear a crash. I pause. Ryle? Nothing. I finish shaving and then wash the soap off. Another crash. What in the world is he doing? I turn off the water and grab a towel running it over myself. Ryle? He still doesn't respond. I pull my jeans on in a hurry and open the door as I'm pulling my shirt over my head. Ryle? The night sedan by our bed is tipped over. I move to the living room and see him sitting on the edge of the couch, his head in one of his hands. He's looking down at something in his other hand. What are you doing? He looks up at me and I don't recognize his expression. I'm confused by what's happening. I don't know if he just got bad news or... Oh God, Elisa. Ryle? You're scaring me. What's wrong? He holds up my phone and just looks at me like I should know what's happening. When I shake my head in confusion, he holds up a piece of paper. Funny thing, he says, setting my phone on the coffee table in front of him. I dropped your phone by accident. Cover pops off. I find this number hidden in the back of it. Oh God, no, no, no. He crumbles the number in his fist. I thought... Huh, that's weird. Lily doesn't hide things from me. He stands up and picks up my phone. So I called it. He tightens his fist around the phone. He's lucky I got his effing voicemail. He chunks my phone clear across the room and it crashes against the wall, shattering to the floor. There's a three-second pause where I think this could go one of the two ways. He's going to leave me or he's going to hurt me. He runs a hand through his hair and walks straight for the door. He leaves. Ryle, I yell. Why did I never throw that number away? I open the door and run after him. He's taking the stairs two at a time, and I finally reach him when he is at the landing of the second floor. I shove myself in front of him and grab his shirt and my fists. Ryle, please, let me explain. He grabs my wrist and pushes me away from him. Be still. I feel his hands on me, gentle, steady. Tears are flowing and for some reason they sting. Lily, be still, please. His voice is soothing. My head hurts. Ryle? I try to open my eyes, but the light is too bright. I can feel a sting at the corner of my eye and I wince. I try to sit up, but I feel his hand press down on my shoulder. You have to be still until I'm finished, Lily. I open my eyes again and look up at the ceiling. It's our bedroom ceiling. Finished with what? My mouth hurts when I speak, so I bring my hand up and cover it. You fell down the stairs, he says. You're hurt. My eyes meet his. There's concern in them, but also hurt. Anger. He's feeling everything right now, and the only thing I feel is confused. I close my eyes again and try to remember why he's angry, why he's hurt. My phone, Atlas's number. The stairwell. I grabbed his shirt. I grabbed his shirt. He pushed me away. You fell down the stairs. But I did not fall. He pushed me again. That's twice. You pushed me, Ryle. I can feel my whole body start to shake with the sobs. I have no idea how bad I'm hurt. But I don't even care. No physical pain could even compare to what my heart is feeling in this moment. I start to slap at his hands, wanting him away from me. I feel him lift off the bed as I curl up into a ball. I wait for him to try and soothe it out, like he did the last time he hurt me, but it never comes. I hear him walking around our bedroom. I don't know what he's doing. I'm still crying when he kneels down in front of me. You might have a confection, he says, matter of fact. You have a small cut on your lip. I just bandaged up the cut on your eye. You don't need stitches. His voice is cold. Does it hurt anywhere else? Your arms? Legs? He sounds just like a doctor and nothing like a husband. 
You pushed me, I say through tears. It's all I can think or say or see. You fell, he says calmly. About five minutes ago, right after I found out what a f effing liar I married, he places something on my pillow next to me. If you need anything, I'm sure you can call this number. I look at the crumpled up piece of paper by my head that holds Atlas's phone number. Ryle, I sob. What is happening? I hear the front door slam. My whole world comes crashing down around me. Ryle, I whisper to no one. I cover my face with my hands and I cry harder than I've ever cried. I'm destroyed. Five minutes. That's all it takes. I completely destroy a person. A few minutes pass. Then maybe. I can't stop crying. I still haven't moved from the bed. I'm scared to look in the mirror. I'm just scared. I hear the front door open and slam shut again. Ryle appears in the doorway and I have no idea if I'm supposed to hate him or be terrified of him or feel bad for him. How can I be feeling all three? He presses his forehead to our bedroom door and I watch as he hits his head against it once, twice, three times. He turns and rushes at me, falling to his knees at the side of the bed. He grabs both of my hands and he squeezes them. Lily, he says, his whole face twisting in pain. Please tell me it's nothing. He brings his hand to the side of my head and I can feel his hand shaking. I can't take this. I can't. He leans forward and presses his lips hard against my forehead, then rests his forehead against mine. Please tell me you aren't seeing him. Please. I'm not even sure I can tell him that because I don't even want to speak. He stays pressed against me, his hands wrapped tightly in my hair. It hurts so much, Lily. I love you so much. I shake my head, wanting the truth out of me so he'll see what a huge mistake he just made. I forgot his number was even there, I say, quietly. The day after the fight in the restaurant, he came to the store. You can ask Alisa. He was only there for five minutes. He took my phone from me and he put his number inside of it because he did not believe I was safe with you. I forgot it was there, Ryle. I've never looked at it. He breathes out a shaky breath and begins nodding with relief. You swear, Lily. You swear on our marriage and our lives and on everything that you are that you haven't spoken to him since that day. He pulls back so he can look me in the eyes. I swear, Ryle, you overreacted before giving me the chance to explain, I say to him. Now, get the F out of my apartment. My words knock the breath from him. I see it happen. His back meets the walls behind him, and he stares at me silently in shock. Lily, he whispers, you fell down the stairs. I can't tell if he's trying to convince me or himself. I calmly repeat myself. Get out of my apartment. He remains frozen in place. I step up on the bed. My hand immediately goes to the throbbing in my eye. He pushes himself up off the floor. When he takes a step forward, I scoot back on the bed. You are hurt, Lily. I'm not leaving you alone. I grab one of my pillows and throw it at him like it could actually do damage. Get out! I yell. He catches the pillow. I grab the other one and stand up on the bed and start swinging at him as I scream, Get out! Get out! Get out! I toss the pillow on the floor after the front door slams shut. I run to the living room and deadbolt the door. I run back to my bedroom and fall onto my bed, the same bed I share with my husband, the same bed he makes gloves to me on, the same bed he lays me on when it's time for him to clean up his messes. Chapter 20 I tried salvaging my phone uh, before I fell asleep last night, but it was no use. It was in two completely separate pieces. I set my alarm so I could get up early and stop and get a new one on my way into work today. My face doesn't look as bad as I feared it would. Of course, it's not something I could hide from Elisa, but I'm not even going to try and do that. I part my hair to the side to cover up most of the bandage, while I placed over my eye. 
The only thing visible from last night is the cut on my lip and the hickey he gave me on my neck. Effing irony at its best. I grab my purse and open the front door. I stop short when I see the lump at my feet. It moves. It's several seconds before I realize that lump is actually Ryle. He slept out here. He pulls himself to his feet as soon as he realizes I've opened the door. He's in front of me, bleeding eyes, gentle hands on my cheeks, lips on my mouth. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I pull back and scrawl my eyes over him. He slept out here. I step out of my apartment and pull. My door shut. I calmly walk past him and down the stairs. He follows me the entire way to my car, begging me to talk to him. I don't. I leave. It's an hour later when I have a new phone in my hands. I'm sitting in my car at the cell phone store when I turn it on. I watch the screen as 17 messages appear, all from Elisa. I guess it would make sense that Ryle did not call me all night, since he knew what kind of shape my phone was in. I start to open the text message when my phone begins ringing. It's Elisa. Hello? Lily, what in the hell is going on? Oh my god, you can't do this to me. I'm pregnant. I start my car and set the phone to Bluetooth while I drive toward the store. Elisa is off today. She's only got a few days left before she gets a jump start on her maternity leave. I'm okay, I tell her. Ryle is okay. We got into a fight. I'm sorry I couldn't call you. He broke my phone. She qu She's quiet for a moment and then, He did? Are you okay? Where are you? I'm fine, heading to work now. Good. I'm almost there myself. I start to protest, but she hangs up before I have the chance. By the time I make it to the store, she's already there. I open the front door, ready to field questions and defend my reasons for kicking her brother out of my apartment, but I stop short when I see the two of them standing at the counter. Ryle is leaning against it, and Alisa has her hands on top of his, saying something to him that I can't hear. They both turn to face me when they hear the door close behind me. Ryle, Alisa whispers, what did you do to her? She walks around the counter and pulls me in for a hug. Oh, Lily, she says, running her hand down my back. She pulls back with tears in her eyes and her reaction confuses me. She obviously knows Ryle is responsible, but if that's the case, it seems she would be attacking him or at least yelling. She turns back to Ryle and he's looking up at me apologetically, longingly, like he wants to reach out and hug me, but he's scared to death to touch me. He should be. You need to tell her, Elisa says to Ryle. He instantly drops his head in his hands. Tell her, Elisa says, her voice angrier now. She has the right to know, Ryle. She's your wife. If you don't tell her, I will. Ryle's shoulders roll forward and his head is fully pressed against the counter now. Whatever it is, Elisa wants him to tell me. Has him so agonized, I can't even look at me. I clench my stomach, feeling the angst deeper than my soul. Alisa spins toward me and puts her hand on my shoulders. Hear him out, she begs. I'm not asking you to forgive him, because I have no idea what happened last night. But just please, as my sister-in-law and my best friend, give my brother a chance to talk to you. Alisa said she would watch the store for the next hour until another employee comes in for their shift. I was still so upset with Ryle. I did not want him in the same car with me. He said he would send for an Uber and meet me at my apartment. My entire drive home, I agonized over what he could possibly need to tell me that Alisa already knows. So many things went through my head. Is he dying? Has he been cheating on me? Did he lose his job? She did not seem to know the details of what happened between us last night, so I have no idea how this relates to that. Ryle finally walks through my front door, ten minutes after me. I'm sitting on the couch, nervously picking at my nails. I stand up and start to pace as he slowly walks to the chair and takes a seat. He leans forward, clasping his hands in front of him. Please sit down, Lily. He says it pleadingly, like he can't take seeing me worry. I return to my seat on the couch, but I scoot to the arm, pull my feet up and... Bring my hands to my mouth. Are you dying? 
his eyes stretch wide and he immediately shakes his head. No, no, it's nothing like that. Then what is it? I just want him to spit it out. My hands are starting to shake. He sees how much he's freaking me out. So he leans forward and pulls my hands from my face, holding them his. Part of me doesn't want him touching me after what he did last night. But a piece of me needs the reassurance from him. The anticipation of what I'm about to find out is making me nauseous. No one is dying. I am not cheating on you. What I'm about to tell you isn't going to hurt you, okay? It's all in the past. But Elisa thinks you need to know, and so do I. I nod and he releases my hands. He's the one up and pacing now, back and forth behind the coffee table. It's as if he's having to work up the courage to find his own words, and that's making me even more nervous. He sits in the chair again. Lily, do you remember the night we met? I nod. You remember when I walked out onto the roof how angry I was? I nod again. He was kicking the chair. It was before he knew marine great polymer was virtually indestructible. Do you remember my naked truth? What I told you about that night and what caused me to be so angry? I lean my head down and think back to that night and to all the truths he told me. He said marriage repulsed him. He was only into one night stands. He never wanted to have kids. He was mad about a patient he had lost that night. I start nodding. The little boy, I said, that's why you were mad, because a little boy died and it upset you. He blows out a quick breath out of relief. Yes, that's why I was mad. He stands up again, and it's like I see his entire soul crumble. He presses his palms against his eyes and fights back tears. When I told you about what happened to him, do you remember what you said to me? I feel like I'm about to cry and I don't even know why yet. Yes. I told you I could not imagine what something like that will do to that little boy's brother, the one who accidentally shot him. My lips start to tremble. And that's when you said I'll destroy him for life. That's what I will do. Oh God. Where is he going with this? Ral walks over and drops down to his knees in front of me. Lily, he says. I knew it would destroy him. I knew exactly what that little boy was feeling, because that's what happened to me, to Elisa's and my older brother. I can't hold in the tears. I just start crying and he wraps his arms tightly around my waist and lays his head on my lap. I shot him, Lily, my best friend, my big brother. I was only six years old. I did not even know I was holding a real gun. His whole body begins to shake and he grips me even tighter. I press a kiss into his hair because it feels like he's on the verge of a breakdown, just like that night on the roof. And while I'm still so angry at him, I also still love him, and it absolutely kills me to find this out about him, about Elisa. We sit quietly for a long time, his head on my lap, his arms around my waist, my lips and his hair. She was only five when it happened. Emerson was seven. We were in the garage, so no one heard our screams for a long time, and I just sat there, and... He pulls away from my lap and stands up, facing the other direction. After a long stretch of silence, he sits down on the couch and leans forward. I was trying to... Ral's face contorts in pain, and he lowers his head, covering it with his hands, shaking it back and forth. I was trying to put everything back inside his head, I thought I could fix him, Lily. My hand flies up to my mouth. I gasp so loudly. There's no way to hide it. I have to stand up so I can catch a breath. It doesn't help. I still can't breathe. Ral walks over to me, taking my hands and pulling me to him. We hug each other for a solid minute when he says, I would never tell this to you because I want it to excuse my behavior. He pulls back and looks at me firmly in the eyes. You have to believe that. Elisa wanted me to tell you all of this because since that happened, there are things I can't control. I get angry. I black out. I've been in therapy since I was six years old. But it is not my excuse. It is my reality. He wipes away my tears, scrattling my head against his shoulder. 
when you ran after me last night. I swear I had no intention of hurting you. I was upset and angry. And sometimes when I feel that much emotion, something inside of me just snaps. I don't remember the moment I pushed you, but I know I did. I did. All I was thinking when you were running after me was how I needed to get away from you. I wanted you out of my way. I did not process that there were stairs around us. I did not process my strength compared to yours. I effed up, Lily. I effed up. He lowers his mouth to my ear. His voice cracks when he says, You are my wife. I'm supposed to be the one who protects you from the monsters. I'm not supposed to be one. He holds me with so much desperation. He begins to shake. I have never in all my life felt so much pain radiating from one human. It breaks me. It rips me apart from the inside out. All my heart wants to do is wrap tightly around his. But even with everything he just told me, I'm still fighting on my own forgiveness. I swore I would not let it happen again. I swore to him and to myself that if he ever hurt me again, I would leave. I pull away from him, unable to look him in the eye. I walk toward my bedroom to try and take a moment to just catch my breath. I close my bathroom door behind me and grip the sink, but I can't even stand up. I end up sliding to the floor in a heap of tears. This isn't how this was supposed to be my whole life. I knew exactly what I would do if a man ever treated me the way my father treated my mother. It was simple. I would leave and it would never happen again. But I did not leave. And now, here I am with bruises and cuts on my body at the hands of the man who is supposed to love me. At the hands of my own husband. And still, I'm trying to justify what happened. It was an accident. He thought I was cheating on him. He was hurt and angry and I got in his way. I bring my hands to my face and I sob because I feel more pain for that man out there knowing what he went through as a child than I feel for myself. And that doesn't make me feel selfless or strong. It makes me feel pathetic and weak. I'm supposed to hate him. I'm supposed to be the woman my mother was never strong enough to be. But if I'm emulating my mother's behavior, then that would mean Ryle is emulating my father's behavior. But he isn't. I have to some stop comparing us to them. We are our own individuals in an entirely different situation. My father... We are our own individuals in an entirely different situation. My father never had an excuse for his anger, nor was he immediately apologetic. The way he treated my mother was much worse than what's happened between Ryle and me. Ryle just opened up to me in a way that he's probably never opened up to anyone. He's struggling to be a better person for me. Yes, he screwed up last night. But he's here and he's trying to make me understand his past and why he reacted the way he did. Humans aren't perfect and I can't let the only example I've ever witnessed of marriage weigh in on my own marriage. I wipe my eyes and pull myself up. When I look in the mirror, I don't see my mother. I just see me. I see a girl who loves her husband and wants more than anything to be able to help him. I know Ryle. And I are strong enough to move past this. Our love is strong enough to get us through this. I walk out of the bathroom and back up into the living room. Ryle stands up and faces me, his face full of fear. He's scared I'm not going to forgive him. And I'm not sure that I do forgive him. But an act doesn't have to be forgiven in order to learn from it. I walk over to him and I grab both of his hands and mine. I speak to him with nothing but naked truth. Remember what you said to me on the roof that night? You said, there is no such thing as bad people. We are all just people who sometimes do bad things. He nods and squeezes my hand. You aren't a bad person, Ryle. I know that. You can still protect me when you are upset. Just walk away. And I'll walk away. We'll leave the situation until you are calm enough to talk about it, okay? You're not a monster, Ryle. You're only human. And as humans, we can't expect to shoulder all of our pain. Sometimes we have to share it with the people who love us so we don't come crashing down from the weight of it all. But I can't help you unless I know you need it. Ask me for help. We'll get through this. I know we can. 
He exhales what feels like every breath he's been holding in since last night. He wraps his arms tightly around me and buries his face in my hair. Help me, Lily, he whispers. I need you to help me. He holds me against him, and I know deep in my heart that I'm doing the right thing. There is so much more good in him than bad, and I will do whatever I can to convince him of that until he can see it too. To be continued.